Namaste and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu, the 29th in the series. This one follows very closely to the previous verse, which you should also take a look at before uh, if you haven't already seen it. Having discarded the body like a corpse, and without uttering I by mouth, scrutinizing with an inward diving mind, where does this feeling I arise? Is alone the path of knowledge, jnana marga. Merely thinking or meditating, I am not this body composed of five sheaths, I am that, the absolute reality, or Brahman is in a roundabout way an aid to the path of knowledge or inquiry. But is it really correct practice of self-inquiry, atma vichara, the direct path of knowledge? No. <laughs> and why is that? Because, as my Buddhist meditation master once said to me, Nibbana is non-conceptual. Boom! It hit me like a ton of bricks. I instantly went into deep meditation. <laughs> it took me a year and a half to work out the consequences or the deep meaning of that. And similarly, when Ramana gives an instruction like this, it should hit us really hard. Because what have we been doing? Reading books, going to talks and lectures, maybe going to workshops, maybe sitting in meditation and just thinking, huh? I am that, I am that. <laughs> I am not the body. Huh? The very first thing my Adi Guru taught his disciples is, you are not this body. Did any of them realize it? Because we see them later on competing for positions of power in religious organization, trying to make money by hook or by crook uh, to shore up their positions in a religious organization and to, to purchase name and fame and disciples. So what kind of realization is that? Why didn't they get it? Because they were in the realm of thought. Thinking, I am not the body, is very different from realizing, I am not the body. So I know what you're going to say. Well, how do you do that? <laughs> the Buddha gives the eight jhanas, the eight platforms or bases of meditation. And so by going into these bases one by one, they become subtler and subtler until one completely forgets about the body. The first one is directed thought. And the second one is directed thought without words. And so on and so on. And they get really subtle. Like the fifth jhana is unlimited space. Now, if you really realize unlimited space, uh, well, where is this body? <laughs> the whole universe shrinks down to a tiny dot and then disappears. <laughs> Lost in unlimited space. Because no matter how big the creation is, it's still limited. And unlimited means unlimited. So in unlimited space, the creation I mean, can't even be found. Then what? Unlimited consciousness. Well, of course, that's Brahman. But a funny thing happened on the way to the meditation hall. <laughs> If you actually realize unlimited space, emptiness, no thingness, what's going to happen? 
Brahman is going to manifest in the middle of that. Why? It's a rule. It's a law of the universe, of consciousness, of existence. That when you take something to an extreme, the opposite manifests. So if you take emptiness all the way to the point of nothingness, what happens? You get everythingness. <laughs> <laughs> or Brahman. So this is the extraordinary thing about the Buddha's path. It's not really different from the Vedic path at all. In fact, the whole teaching of the Buddha fits very nicely in the category of Raja Yoga. Because what is the ultimate in Raja Yoga is the destruction of the mind and ego. And I don't think you can find a better method or approach to it than the one taught by the Buddha. The final stage, the highest jhana, is neither perception nor non-perception. It's a really tricky one. I'm not going to try to describe it here. I already talked about it in the earlier series on Nibbana. So you should take a look at that if you're curious. But to get rid of this idea of I as an individual ego is the whole point of meditation. So if you come out of meditation, uh, sitting in your zendo or whatever, and then you're going out in the world trying to make a name for yourself, trying to collect money and followers, writing and selling books and after name and fame, uh, giving interviews, <laughs> and so on like this. What is that? Huh? That means you haven't realized it. Because if you really realize non-self, or the destruction of the mind through emptiness, you're just going to sit around and like bliss out. <laughs> There's nothing else to do. Why? For who? You see? So these people who, you know, sit down and meditate for a few minutes and then go run around with an active social life and business and all that are just fooling themselves. They're simply saying, I am that. I am not the body. I am not the mind. I am not this ego. But they're not realizing anything. Why? Because they're stuck on the conceptual platform, the verbal platform, the mental platform. And on the mental platform of name and form, the name or the word is the thing. But when I started this series more than five years ago, this YouTube channel, I was coming from being in a faith-based process for over 20 years, and it just didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was precisely this, that we were not getting beyond the name and form. In fact, we were encouraged to cling to the name and form. In dualism, dualistic philosophy is like that. But it doesn't bring self-realization. So I said, wait a minute, I'm going to start my search all over again. And this time, instead of basing it on faith or information or verbal knowledge, I'm going to base it on experience. And so I began to cultivate the experience of meditation rather than the knowledge or the words about meditation. It makes all the difference in the world. If you're not getting this, if you're having trouble understanding what I'm talking about, look up phenomenology. Phenomenology. It's a very uh, closely allied discipline to existentialism. Existentialism is about what is. And phenomenology is about experiencing what is. Not what I think it is, or what somebody said it is, 
or what it's written in this book that it is, but what it is, how I experience it. And that is the only platform, although it may be slower in the beginning, that's the only platform that leads to actual realization. Now what does he here say? Where does this feeling, I, arise? Not the word, not the concept, not the idea of I, but the feeling I, the feeling of egotism. What is it? You have to look into it for yourself. Nobody can tell you because it's an experience. You know, I, I could have an ice cream cone here and I'm going, mm, mm, yeah, this vanilla ice cream, vanilla is my favorite. This vanilla ice cream tastes really, really good. But are you going to experience that from my description? No, it's impossible. So the real path, jnana marga, huh? not vidya marga. Vidya is verbal knowledge. Jnana is experiential knowledge, phenomenological experience, where one is aware of one's awareness. So he says, merely thinking or meditating, I am not this body composed of five sheaths. Huh? The anamaya kosha, the manomaya kosha, the vijnana maya kosha, huh? and ultimately the ananda maya kosha. These different sheaths. I am not this body. I am not this mind. Then what am I? Well, what's left? <laughs> Only pure consciousness. So that's what I was talking about in my series, Apophatic Antifragility. That the Buddha was teaching something by not talking about it. He was teaching something that could not be spoken about. So he didn't speak about it. <laughs> Instead, he spoke about the way to experience it. And if you're awake, if you're thinking, if you're intelligent, then by doing those methods, you would experience it and you would recognize, oh, this is it. So Nibbana, or as Ramana calls it, the self, as the Vedas call it, Brahman, is a real experience. It's not a thing because it does not come into being. If it came into being, if it had a beginning, it would also have an end. So Brahman, or the self, exists outside of time. You can call it eternity if you want. But what it really means, it has no beginning or no end. No boundaries whatsoever. No divisions. It's one without a second. So when people talk about being one with God, <laughs> or I am that, huh? you still have I and that. Duality. So they haven't realized it. Because if they had realized it, like Ramana, they would be saying I, I, not I am. Because I am requires a predicate. I am that. I am this, I'm that, I'm something else, I'm all these other things, whatever. That's duality. But real non-duality is I, I. I am I. Whatever that is. <laughs> so, to think that I am not this body, I am not this mind, this is a very indirect very preparatory stage. It's just the theory. It's not the practice. So if you're sitting there and trying to meditate and you're just thinking, neti neti, I'm not this, I'm not that, or I am that, huh? That's, you're not there yet. <laughs> That's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to say, okay, 
set aside all those words and just sit there and do nothing and feel where is this I coming from. And if you trace it down to its source, you know, I'm going to go a little over time because this is a story well worth telling. In the beginning of the creation, as described in the Vedas, Brahma found himself seated on a lotus flower. And all around was this churning ocean, as far as he could see. And so he's trying to understand, well, what am I doing here? What is this? Where did I come from? What am I supposed to do? And so he went, because there was no other place for him to go, <laughs> he went down the stem of the lotus to the very root. And he heard the word tapa. Tapa means austerity. It means sadhana. It means meditation. So he came back up out of the root of the lotus and sat on the blossom for 10,000 years and meditated. And at the end, he became self-realized. So what does this mean? I was just reading in the commentary of Shankaracharya's Sri Dakshinamurti Stotram that in the spine, according to the yoga system, there are three channels, the Ida, the Pingala, and the Shushumna. And they are on the left, the right, and the center of the spine, respectively. And then I found the remarkable statement that the thousand-petaled lotus, the Sahasrara Chakra, is linked to the root of the spine, the Muladhara Chakra, by the stem of the lotus, which is the Shushrumna. So in other words, <laughs> the story given in the Puranas is actually an um, allegory, a metaphor. It is we who are seated on the lotus, and it is we who have to go down the stem to the root to find the source of energy. And it's not Brahma, it's we who have to sit contemplating that energy wordlessly for as long as it takes to reach full realization. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> Om Harihi Om. <laughs>